Go ahead and just describe yourself and your history, say, in maybe one minute. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Michael C. Rupert, otherwise known as Mike. I'm an author, uh, an investigative journalist, was, and retired from that now for the most part. Uh, uh, I'm a singer in a band, and I, I've also been in a, a couple of films, a, a few films along the way, but I, th I think the one everybody will know me for now is a movie called Collapse. It's a documentary about the collapse of uh, human industrial civilization, which is underway even as we speak in the film today. So we're going to get right to uh, we're going to get right down to the bottom of it here. I've got a lot of questions for you. <laughs> we're going to start with money. So, and this of course is the crux of the issue. What I've done is essentially quoted your book, and I want you to, in certain instances, restate what I state. I'll tell you as we go along, and expand. So that's the, the nature of the interview. And I also have some singular statements that are in your book that are phenomenal, and you can either restate them outright or rephrase them. Since I'm going to be pairing you in with Heinberg and Colin, and there's got probably going to be maybe 15 people in the film overall, what actually makes it into the final cut is fairly limited. So singular statements are really important. Because Understood. Great, tra great transition. Understood. How am I framed? I'm framed from what? Here to here? You are framed, yeah. We can go a little higher here. Okay. Here. Oh, okay. Good. All right. You quoted... The heart of the issue is that it's the way money works that has locked us into an inevitable collision of two mutually exclusive operating principles. A man-made requirement for infinite growth collides with a man-sustaining and unyielding finite planet and the physical laws that govern the universe. This is probably the most important issue that I want to address mm -hmm. in this section of the film, so you can just jump straight into this collision. Okay. The human economic paradigm that has been in place basically for all of recorded history since money was first invented, or certainly since money was, was first lent at interest, is that we live in an infinite growth paradigm. The economic uh, paradigm we live in now is, is a Ponzi scheme. It's n nothing grows forever. It's not possible. As a great uh, psychologist James Hillman wrote, the only thing that grows in a human body after a certain age is cancer. And I think that that's clearly what we're seeing now at, uh, at the end of human industrial civilization with a population approaching 7 billion. Money is only uh, a symbol. It only represents the ability to do work. And energy is the ability to do work. And by printing money, you don't create more energy. That's good. The, actually, you know what? We'll just keep going straight because I have a few variations on this. Okay. Okay, here's one. State this and expand. As the infinite growth economy expands, the number of consumers must also grow for the ramifications of that. Go ahead and state that and describe why that's a problem. Exactly. Well, everything in, a, in an infinite growth paradigm has to con keep growing. It's not just the amount of money that has to keep growing, it's the amount of consumers that have to keep growing as well. Now, the only thing that's made that possible uh, in, in human civilization is oil. If you look at the presence of oil or when it was first introduced in the early 1900s, late 1890s, human population shot from roughly two, two and a half billion to almost seven billion people. That's all as a result of oil. Uh, so, it, and, and the monetary paradigm requires that you keep generating more uh, consumers to borrow money at interest to generate more money, and obviously that's not possible on a finite planet. I was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal uh, shortly after the movie Collapse came out, and they asked me uh, what the point of uh, the, the, the point of the movie was, and I said it very simply. I said it is not possible to continue infinite consumption and infinite population growth on a finite planet. That simple. Perfect. And this cap couples in with something very specific that I want to tie in here: the American dream. As you define it in your book, describe how the American dream, as we perceive it today, is in fact completely destructive and unsustainable. Well, the American dream is based on rampant consumerism. It, it, it is based upon the fact that mainstream media, and especially commercial advertising, uh, all corporations who need this infinite growth, have convinced us or brainwashed uh, most people in America, and hence the world, that uh, we have to have X number of material possessions and the possibility of gaining in infinitely more material possessions in order to be happy. That's just not true. And that's also uh, 
a big lie. Uh, you know, the, the American dream says you can have anything you want if you work hard enough for it. Well, what, what that doesn't say, according to the old American dream, was if you burn enough oil to get it. I was still blown away that this is the way we operate. I mean, how, how amazing. How, how do you come to this? I know. We're still oblivious to it, but there's more questions on that as we go along. Well, there's here. a lot of people waking up, I'm telling you that. Yeah, well, they certainly are going to be forced to. Okay, you already mentioned that the, the global economy is a Ponzi scheme. I've talked about this a lot in the, in the prior films. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, state, as you did actually in Collapse, it's just such a great sound bite. Define why it's a Ponzi scheme. You don't have to go into fractional reserve, but talking about loans and things that relate to the fact that more money has to constantly be generated. For example, uh, if you have a comp compound interest-based loan and you don't pay it off for years, you're actually making tons of money because you're because you're waiting to pay it off, therefore all Yeah, I need to mention fractional reserve. Okay, I, that's, that's fine. I, I, that's, I guess I don't want to be redundant with the other sections. Uh, uh, Go ahead okay. and just do what you feel is okay. relevant. Our economy has, or the global economy, has three basic things to govern. One is fractional reserve banking, but banks printing money out of nothing. It's also based upon compound interest. When you borrow money, you have to pay back more than you borrowed, which means that you, in effect, create money out of thin air, again, which has to be serviced by creating still more money. Uh, and and uh, uh, debt-based growth and financing, which is where money is created. So all this says is that uh, people are basically vehicles to just create money, which must create more money to keep the whole thing from falling apart, which is what's happening right now. Since the uh, seven hundred, you know, trillion dollar derivatives bubble has burst, um, do you think that this type of collapse would have been inevitable even without the trigger of the bubble burst of the uh, the, the derivatives market, which essentially started it? Well, the the derivatives market has only be just begun to burst. It, it, we haven't seen it, it, it. It'll collapse in stages. We're now seeing sovereign debt default as Dubai has defaulted. We're seeing uh, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, the so-called pig nations, uh, on the brink of sovereign default. Default. Great Britain on the. These are all as a result of derivatives. So we haven't seen the full impact. But uh, as as a result of this starting, it's it's apparent to those who are if you will, outside the matrix, uh, that, uh, that everything must collapse. I mean, what, what the global financial markets are doing without the energy, cheap energy to back it up is they're chasing that $700 trillion derivatives bubble right down the drain. I know people like to play the blame game as far as what's happening in the economy, and I just want to make sure this myth is dispelled that, that the nature of the system itself, because it's infinitely expanding, it would have fallen on its own weight regardless of what happened in the derivatives bubble. Mm -hmm. Would you state that, actually? But if you agree with that statement? Because these are important points. Yeah. Well, any pyramid scheme, by definition, has to collapse. That's what happens to all bubbles. It's the history of every bubble, every pyramid scheme in human history. This is just now the biggest one. It's the economic paradigm that governs the whole planet. It's the life bubble. It's the population pyramid scheme that, that must collapse also. It's inevitable. It's like a law of physics. Uh, there's been no situation ever recorded, whether it's a, a bacteria in a petri dish with unlimited food and no competition, or caribou on a on an on an Arctic island. Population shoots right up and explodes, and then all of a sudden it crashes, and there's a massive die-off. That's that that's a law as fundamental as the law of gravity. Sure. On that note, this is a little bit of an aside. If it's not comfortable for you to talk about it, we have a lot of cultural dispositions that are obsessed with reproduction, procreation, the mm -hmm. Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, describe the, the cultural ramification, the philosophical clash that's occurred in modern society because of the lack of realization that we live on a closed, finite planet. Where do you want to go with that? Most, most of the religions on this planet trace their origins back three, two, three, four thousand years. It, it, go back to Abraham for... Uh, the Jewish, Christ, Christian, and Muslim faith, uh, you know, Buddha, Buddhism, all the other major religions. They've been around for a while, but those religions were formulated by men at, at a time when the only way the religion could survive was by having more babies and more members. So uh, all of the current religions governing this planet, with the, with the exceptions of Buddhism, Hindu, Hinduism, and uh, Taoism, let's say, 
uh, and Native American spirituality are based upon the European re religions, the, the Middle East, are, are based upon infinite growth of population. So religious laws and ordinances were written in to make sure that there were as many babies as possible because that was the way it was done a thousand, two thousand years ago when, when the earth was basically untapped. It was assumed there were infinite resources. That's why I say God is on the table now. Religions are not working that uh, push that uh, paradigm. Good. And we're, we're going to touch upon some aspects of that as we move forward. Here's a singular statement, sound bite. Until you change the monetary paradigm, you change nothing. Or, until you change the way money works, you change nothing. In other words, every attempt to try and pass a law or do this good or do this bad, right this wrong, is always overcome by the profit motive. That's why this carbon control bullshit nonsense coming out of the Obama administration is nothing but a financial gimmick. It has nothing to do with the environment. That's because money trumps everything in that world. Good. Describe the importance of a new paradigm known as what you refer to as a steady state economy as opposed to an infinite growth economy and how this is required for the future. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not the first to propose this. I mean, the true prophets like M. King Hubbard and a great many others uh, envisioned and, and saw the need for a steady state economy 50, 60 years ago. Uh, but basically it has to be not only steady state, meaning w w without a, a growth, but it also has to be resource-based. There has to be a link between the economy and the resources of this planet, the resources being, of course, all animal and plant life, the health of the oceans and everything else. If man do doesn't stop fouling his home, there's no place to live. That's a, such a critical point, and I, I was actually surprised. I was actually it wasn't until I read your book, and I just realized how brilliant Hubbard was in and of himself. Oh my God! Yeah. Because I'm I'm going to be researching a lot of his stuff as I move forward. I just knew of him as a technocrat. Maybe he was involved in this, all the same resource-based economy. He stuff. was he was a true prophet. Absolutely. Okay, here's a here's a critical one. I think is very important. You could restate and expand this. More money can be made more quickly by accelerating decline, mm. bankrupting the country, starving people, and selling assets than by investing it in rebuilding? Um, I, I had one of, one of the biggest epiphanies of my life. I was at a peak oil conference in Paris in, in 2003. And a Dutch economist, Martin Van Moor, came out and just told the truth. He, and his, his quote was very simple. It may not be profitable to slow decline. The way Wall Street works, the way the economic paradigm works, not just Wall Street, you can take uh, the city of London or any other financial center in the world, Hong Kong, um, it, uh, profit governs everything and you make money on the way up and you make money on the way down. Uh, as, uh, as many, including Zeitgeist, have so correctly pointed out, you have to create problems to create profit, which is absolutely absurd. Uh, we see, uh, take a look at the bailouts, all that trillion dollars that was uh, printed by the Fed, the 11 trillion of bailouts and everything else, that's all based upon disaster capitalism, which is what we're seeing now as Haiti is being raped after the earthquake. There is no profit under the current paradigm uh, in saving lives, putting balance on this planet, having justice uh, and peace or anything else. There's just no profit there. Yeah, beautifully stated. All right, here's a, here's a, sorry, these are, these are jumping around a little bit. I hope you can, hmm. obviously you have a problem with that. Given the current trends that we're seeing right now, assuming, assuming exactly what you assume in the book, not, not the 25-point plan, nothing, no, no changes at all, where do you expect us to be in, say, two or three decades with the collapse? No, well, I have no idea in two or three decades. You know, I, whatever you want to say yeah. about the future. And, and <laughs> as, as don't, you don't speculate as much, but yeah. given what's happening now and the basic ignorance of the population, the lack of uh, credibility of government and the abominable financial system, how do you see the chain of causality occurring? Okay. Um, I have said clearly for the last couple of years, and as I said in my book, 2010 will be the year that the United States economy is dealt, dealt a mortal blow. Not only the U.S. economy, but the global economy. Peak oil is here. It's been acknowledged uh, by many people. It's a fact. And it's not just peak oil. It's the fact that the corruption of the economic paradigm is all hitting all at once. It's a perfect storm. 
So once collapse happens, it's not possible to predict how collapse unfolds. What, what collapse brings is chaos and uncertainty in massive proportion. Uh, I have no idea what the world will look like in two or three decades. It might look like the movie The Road, and that's what I'm trying to prevent. A mass die-off, the death of civilization, culture, the ability to manufacture critical uh, goods and services to uh, electricity, power, all the, all the things that we know. That's a possibility that we could wind up in that situation. That's why people like I and, and Richard Heinberg and Colin Campbell and Matthew Simmons and all of the people who have been out here screaming our lungs out for years are so upset is because we must make a change before that becomes a certainty, a certain outcome. What I see is extremely massive uh, instability. I think the next phase we're going to see after the next round of economic collapse is massive civil unrest. When employment checks stop being paid because the states have no money left. Uh, when, when the homeless and, and, and the poor start to have their temper tantrum as they move into the anger phase of accepting uh, collapse. If you were to summarize the evidence of peak oil to someone who's never even heard of it, how would you do it? The world is now using six barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. Five years ago, it was using four barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. A year from now, it's going to be using eight barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. And the barrels it finds now are really expensive to get. They're in bathtubs and, and hot tub size deposits when what we need is about five Olympic swimming pools worth of oil to offset a global 9% decline rate. It's simple arithmetic. Okay, all right, well, that's, that's more advanced than I was looking for. Oh, okay. That, that's okay, that, that, that works. Let me make one adjustment, though, I'll say. Watching here now. Hurt your hand? Oh, I shattered my thumb in 2007 in a horseback riding accident, and I had, I shot it all the, I landed on my thumb from about eight feet in the air. Oh. And it just drove this up and shattered all these bones. So I, I get a little tweak in there from time to time. Sorry to hear that. <clears throat> well, Such is life. It's just another scar. Right? Just another scar. Okay. Describe the significance of the 2001 NEPDG report and, and why it's classified, what you interpret that as meaning. The... Uh, National Energy Policy Development Group, run by Dick Cheney, which I wrote about extensively in my book, Crossing the Rubicon, is probably full of more useful information uh, that we wouldn't have to pay for all over again right now, but it's classified. It's classified because I make a case in the book, and I think it's pretty clear that what Dick Cheney and et al. were, were doing on an emergency basis was, making a, was having a damage control meeting say, okay, we're running out, it's a crisis, we know that, we've known it for a while, who's got the oil, where is it, and what do we have to do to get it? And, and there is no accurate, real, real accurate inventory that's trustworthy of how much oil reserves are really left anywhere in the world, but I'll bet you it's in that report. And that could save lives if we had access to it. But Dick Cheney fought to the Supreme Court twice, had an ex parte meeting with Justice Antonin Scalia, uh, the, the Constitution didn't matter. The American taxpayers paid for that report. We need to know what's in there. Very good. And the seven pages that were released indicated what? Seven pages that were, that were released as a result of two lawsuits, uh, I think from the Sierra Club and Judicial Watch, uh, uh, showed that there were maps of oil fields. There were lists of who owned what oil fields where. There were, you know, it's clear, it's clear that that's what uh, the uh, task force was looking at and trying to find work workarounds for. One of the workarounds being, of course, 9-11 and the invasion of Iraq. <clears throat> okay, I want you to uh, state this. The current economic implosion will result in the longest lasting economic depression in history. If you can state that and expand why. I, I think I understated in the book when I said it will result in the longest lasting economic depression in history. No, it's the end of human industrial civilization. Uh, Would you state that though? Because my voice will not be on the, on, the, on the video. So just restate it singularly. So, okay. So in other words, that's great actually what you just said. Maybe you can just state that again, but comment uh, whatever you think you can do. There is not, there is not going to be any recovery. This is not some long depression that we're some, someday going to pull out of. This is the end of human industrial civilization. 
the people who are aware and, and who are working, like, like myself, like Zeitgeist, like everybody else, who sees what the real problem is. What, what we're really doing is we're fighting to determine what the new paradigm is going to look like and what values it's going to have and what parts of human civilization and human nature are going to survive from that. We don't want to recreate the old paradigm and start from scratch with no energy to build from. Very good. Very good. There's another one that's there. Okay, let's just jump into the ramification of oil. Restate and expand. The edifice of human civilization is built upon oil, population, transportation, plastics, agriculture. Give, I have some more specific questions as we go along, but give a general overview of the significance of oil for those that have never even considered it. Okay. Oil is the foundation of, and that is present throughout the edifice of human civilization. There are 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy, oil and natural gas, and every calorie of food you and I eat in the industrialized world. Fertilizers are made from natural gas. Pesticides are made from oil. You drive oil-powered machines to plant, plow, irrigate, harvest, transport, package. You wrap the food in plastic, that's oil. All plastic is oil. There are seven gallons of oil in every tire. There's all the paints and resins and uh, are, are all have, your toothpaste is a user of oil. Your toothbrush is made of oil. Oil is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And it's only because of oil that there are 7 billion people or almost 7 billion people on this planet right now. Oil made that happen. And if you take away the oil, you take away the food. If you take away the food, you take away the people. Fair enough. Debunkers of peak oil. What is your response? First of all, what are the typical rebukes against peak oil and what is your response to those rebukes? Well, you know, when, when people talk about rebuttals to peak oil, uh, there aren't any that stand the test anymore. The reason why is because all you have to do is look at what's happening in the world. Uh, that's why there's really not that much debate. You still see articles being generated. People talk about abiotic oil, which is absolute nonsense. Oil being infinitely materialized like a giant hot fudge sundae in the center of the earth and we'll never run it out. That's really strongly ad advocated by Walmart, Time Warner, by General Electric, and by General Motors because they want you to keep buying. But we're now using six barrels of oil for every new one we find, and that gap is getting wider year after year. That's evidence. So, you know, re really it's, it's kind of like if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck. The uh, most common uh, uh, spokespeople to uh, rebut peak oil, Michael Lynch and Daniel Jurgen. I'm sorry, I'm on camera, they're liars. They're absolute liars. We can prove it. Facts prove it. The peak oil movement spent many years, and I in, in, in particular, engaging in debates and arguments. And then all, all of a sudden we had this epiphany one day. We looked around and said, what do we have to argue about? The evidence is all around us. When, when people like me, and, and, and I've been fortunate, I've never counted, kept track, but I have roughly an 80% accuracy rate in, in my predictions. That's because I'm reading a map that says peak oil is real. Now, the people who say that peak oil isn't real, go check their predictions and see how right they are that we're in an economic recovery now. I mean, the, every prediction they've sold to the American people has been proven wrong. So, you know, by their fruits, ye shall know them, so to speak. And just to, you know, people say things like, oh, well, we haven't had a chance to explore certain areas oh, of the yeah. Earth's crust. Go ahead, anything you want. That is absolute nonsense about exploration. Uh, that okay. Does. You know, people say the Earth hasn't been explored. That's absolute bullshit. Uh, the, the planet Earth has been vigorously and thoroughly explored for oil for about 130 years now. All the major oil companies, especially from roughly the, the uh, 1920s when, when Britain carved up the Middle East and we got Saudi Arabia, that was all b because oil had been scouted. There's never been a, a discovery anywhere near, near the size of Gawar, the, the largest field in the world. Never has it been found. And all those big fields would have been found by now. Uh, why is Saudi Arabia drilling offshore when, if, if they have so much oil onshore? It costs five times as much to do that. So the bullshit about exploration is just that. It's bullshit. We know, you know, and, and besides that, whatever oil is left to find is no longer low-hanging fruit that you just pick off a tree. It's fruit that you got to go out into 10, 15,000 feet of water and drill 4,000 feet below that, spend $25 million on a well, and maybe get a dry hole. Good. 
And all, all your, the only other point I think would be good to add to that, which I think I'll get to in a second, I should remember. Well, I'll just state it. The uh, government actions reveal a lot. Obviously, these are people mm -hmm. now. We have the military evidently starting to put solar panels in their military vehicles. That might be a good point to bring up. We have these wars that are blatantly resource-based. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and describe the actions of those in the know and how they're revealing their hand. When I was publishing from the wilderness, my newsletter, we, we uh, from uh, 1998 to 2006, we I spent an enormous amount of money researching what the government was doing, especially what the military was doing. It's not just that the military is now getting solar-powered laptops and solar panels on vehicles. They have built some of the largest, most massive solar arrays to power bases near San Diego and elsewhere. Uh, <coughs> the military clearly knows exactly what's coming, and they've been preparing for it for a long time. Uh, we even, uh, I even found a story where the, the, the military was looking to try what the Nazis had tried in World War II, which was the, uh, the fischer tropes proce tropes, tropes process. We were looking to see, I found that the military was, was, was even going to try to attempt what the Nazis tried in World War II, the fischer tropes tropes prods. <laughs> Take a time. That's a tough one. fischer tropes. I, I, I tropes. say it all. Tropes. Uh, you even found a story. Sorry, I shouldn't be laughing when I do that. No, no, that's fine. Take your time. I even found a story where the U.S. military was going to try what the Nazis had tried. In World War II, out of desperation, the conversion of coal to oil through the fischer tropsch process, which is horribly energy intensive. It takes more energy to get anything usable in a, 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 a petroleum-powered engine than you get from burning it. It's, uh, it consumes enormous amounts of coal, destroys wastewater. Those are signs of desperation. Uh, if you watch uh, George Bush, uh, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, uh, all of those people are completely off the grid and self-contained with solar panels, wind generators, their own fresh water supplies. You watch how these guys walk instead of listening to how they talk, and you get a clue as to what's going on. I didn't even know that. So you, you mean George Bush, is, his home is... Uh... In Texas, Crawford, Texas, man. He's completely off the grid. That's hilarious. Got his own generation. He's got solar. He's got wind. He's got water. Dick Cheney's the same way in Wyoming. Describe the bumpy plateau for oil prices and how demand for oil is being literally destroyed at each price spike and how, you know, smaller economies, due to the economic collapse, the GDP has been shrunken in. They can't even afford to get anything for some of them. And this, in other words, destroy the fallacy that these price spikes, where it goes down, actually means that we're doing fine. There's a significance to the bumpy plateau. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. What you see is... Uh, the the peak oil movement has long been aware and predicted what's called the bumpy plateau because we saw evidence of it in the in the uh, 73 74 and 78 arab oil embargoes where uh, oil prices sp spiked to a certain point which we saw in uh, uh, 2008 with 147 dollar a barrel oil and then all of a sudden everything starts shutting down because nobody can afford the oil so you have the economic growth going up price spike everything shuts down that's where we are now then it starts to come up again but what we have now is this is this area where there's there's no more ability to produce cheap energy we're at the peak we're, we're entering the that we have crossed the peak we're on the downslope of oil production no way you're going to get any more out of the ground uh, any faster uh, which means that Things shut down, the price of oil drops, which it did in early 2009, but then as you have an ersatz so-called recovery, the price of oil starts to come back. It's recently been hovering around $80 a barrel, and, and what we see is at $80 a barrel now, with the economic and financial collapse, people are having a hard time affording that. So we run through these spikes. Now we're, uh, as we're shooting this uh, right now, we're on the brink uh, of what may well be an attack on Iran. If that happens, China will back Iran. It, it may be a global nuclear war, in which case you won't have to worry about editing the movie. Uh, but uh, we will see an immediate price spike because Venezuela will shut off oil supplies in solidarity with Iran. Iran will shut off oil supplies to, some supplies to the U.S. They'll try to close the Straits of Hormuz. So you might see oil jump from $80 a barrel to $200 a barrel if there's an attack on Iran within a matter of weeks. Bumpy plateau. That kind of a spike, though, and this is what I've seen uh, as I wrote uh, the new book, Confronting Collapse, 
uh, and what I said clearly in the movie Collapse, is that the next major price spike will be the coup de grace for human industrial civilization. There will be no coming back after that. Then, then we go off the bumpy plateau and down the cliff. Wow. Very good. <clears throat> rationalize, oh, all goes back to its current rates, so we, may, we must be okay. Yeah. Okay, um... Who got eye boogers? What are you doing about eye boogers? There's um, something you alluded to in both of your books at least uh, Rubicon and Collapse, it's uh, the global war on terror. Mm -hmm. Is this essentially a front for the U.S. domination, attempted domination of oil, global oil reserves? Well, the global war on terror is uh, 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 in large part a crock of shit. It, 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 the global war on terror is a joke. Uh, it's it's a pretext. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't terrorists out there who don't like the United States. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that, that under the guise of global war on terror, <clears throat> we have uh, positioned ourselves, we, the United States, not me personally, uh, to uh, strategically dominate most of the available oil on the planet. Sixty percent of the, of, the, of the recoverable oil on the planet is in the Persian Gulf. That's a fact. That's known. The planet's been explored, 60%. Uh, it's very clear, as I demonstrate in my book, that we invaded Iraq for oil. Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11. There was no terrorist threat against the U.S. The global war on terror was used to mask the invasion and occupation of Iraq to control uh, roughly uh, uh, 90 to 100 billion barrels of Iraqi oil for the United States and its allies. Uh, by the way, 90 billion barrels of oil, re recoverable oil, is not a lot. The planet's using a billion barrels every 11 and a half days. Break out your pencil, do the math. Very good. Political philosophy. We live in a, a world where Republican, Democrat, liberal, and then, of course, social philosophy, communism, socialism, fascism. You did a brilliant job of describing the idiotic aspects of these determinations. Go ahead and just summarize why you feel the way you do about this. Mm. Uh, I, I, I totally reject the mainstream media's categorization of anything. Who says I gotta be red or blue? Who says I gotta be Republican or Democrat? Do you really think my mind is limited to those boxes that they try to put me in? Uh, do I have to put a label on, on, on myself that the mainstream media offers me because that's all they offer? No, I don't choose that. Uh, I really am Jeffersonian in, in, in that I think that it's time that every generation, you need to throw out every definition and start from scratch based upon your present reality. Uh, you know, people ask if I'm a socialist or a communist or a capitalist, and I say, I'm none of the above, and why do you, th why do you think that those are the only options? Socialism and capitalism and, and communism were all, uh, all of those political constructs were created by writers who, who, writers and thinkers who assumed that we lived on a planet of infinite resources. Not a one of those political philosophies even contemplates that there might be a shortage of anything. Uh, so, you know, tear everything up, throw it out, get rid of the labels. I don't want any, I don't want any, let's make entirely new labels, but then let's be prepared to throw them out as soon as we have to. Would you like to mirror that comment in any way? Because I think just making sure people understand that we have to have a system based on resources, any singular statement of ideology is relevant. You know, I, I've, I've done a lot of spiritual study in my life of many different religion, religions and forms of spirituality. And, 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 and in many ways, I've, I've, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, comfortable with uh, First Nation, with Native American spirituality. And uh, Native Americans have known this truth for a long time. It was Native Americans who said wisely, I think 100, 150, 200 years ago, that uh, it won't be until uh, the white man has consumed the last fish and cut down the last tree that he will understand that money means nothing. And that's, that, that's the way it is. And, uh, uh, you know, there's... A lot of this stuff is so simple and easy to see once, once you 
just take 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 the red pill. What uh, you know, snap out of it. Good. No, that's a great point. In, in collapse, you used a there was a term I think for it actually. Where there was this collision of um, I can't remember. Maybe it was Hubbard that used. The no, term. it was me. A, a collision of finite energy with the demand for infinite expansion. Basically, state that. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, part of this got edited edited from the movie Collapse. Uh, and let me finish that whole thought. Sure. Uh, von Clausewitz said that war is a continuation of politics by other means. In the movie I said that politics is, is a continuation of economics by other means. But then what, I, w what didn't make it into the movie was the fact that economics is a continuation of energy by other means. Energy is the ability to do work. Do this, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Instead of referring to the prior movie, would you just state right. that statement? Just go ahead and Got state it. the whole thing. Got it. Von Clausewitz said that war is the continuation of politics by other means. I said that, I have said that politics is a continuation of economics by other means. And I've also said that economics is a continuation of energy by other means. Whether the energy is slave labor, which is what the, the planet relied on from, you know, five, 6,000 B.C. Uh, until th through the 1800s, uh, was a form of energy limited by the number of people that could be born on the planet. Uh, money itself can do nothing. You can't put a dollar bill or 20 in your gas tank. You can't eat a $20 bill. It's only a symbol. We print these symbols out of thin air having no connection to reality of any kind. They don't reflect how much energy is available to make that $20 bill worth anything. That's why hyperinflation is coming. Because all, they, all, all the governments of the world have done to back up the financial markets is they've printed money, which doesn't, didn't create any more energy to give that money any meaning. And there was one statement you made, um, you print too much money, it's bad because you cause inflation, you print too little money and you slow economic growth. Could you restate that because I think that's a very great Yeah, well, I'm not in favor of economic growth, but that's, that, that, that's the way the bankers view it. That's what I mean. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, uh, listen, any college student who got, got a hold of their first credit card and had no idea what, what they were digging themselves into and who maxed it out and who, who never made them, who made only the minimal monthly payments understands what kind of hole they dig themselves into when they keep borrowing and spending, essentially printing more money uh, in, in doing so. You're, you're digging a hole from the moment you start. Uh, you know, and, and here we are now standing in what looks like a... a an economic Grand Canyon. We ain't getting out of this hole. The hole's going to close in on top of us. Uh, uh, if I were to talk in spiritual metaphor right now, I would say that debt is the mark of the beast. Debt is the mark of the beast. Uh, if, if you want to go biblical apocalyptic. We're, we, are, we are seeing now debt slaves being created who can't move, they can't travel, they can't go anywhere because they have bad, bad credit reports, they can't get a bank account. This is debt slavery, and that's why I have been screaming for years. It's in all my videos going back to 2003, 2004, all the lectures I gave. Get out of debt. If you want a chance to survive what's coming, get out of debt. pointed out and some of other people that the data that comes from the IEA, it comes from, of course, Wall Street, and it comes from the government, cannot be trusted. And can you give uh, maybe a simple example of information that's been released, that's been debunked by independent research? Or Well, everybody who has oil reserves in the ground are assets against which corporations trading in the economic paradigm borrow money or base their stock value on the amount of oil reserves they have in the ground. It's in their interest to lie. Uh, in 2003, 2004, I think in the 2005, Royal Dutch Shell, Shell Oil Company, was caught lying about uh, how much reserves they really had. Not once, not twice, but four times. One of the co-chairs had to resign. 
the books in uh, the oil books are as cooked as the books of of uh, AIG, Citigroup, as uh, you know, I've done all the financial Enron. Those books are cooked. The Saudis don't dare disclose how much oil they have remaining or that they're past their peak of production because they're liable to face a revolution if they do. Uh, you know, so everybody lies about oil. That's why it's essential to find out how much oil there is uh, and where it is because uh, oil entries for reserves are bookkeeping entries. They have uh, estimated reserves, probable reserves, proven reserves, ultimately recoverable reserves, uh, uh, yet, yet to find, I, I love that, that's an accounting term. They, they book on what they think that they're going to find. Uh, gee, I, I wish I could borrow money, uh, borrow against the money I was hoping to make someday. Uh, so those are all accounting terms. They have nothing to do with science. They're lies. Good. There was one example you had in the book um, where it denoted explicitly how through time there is a documentation of the resources available in certain regions like Dubai. Show you real fast. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Can you give an example if you don't mind recalling that? It's in it's in Rubicon. Um, Just basically about the falsification and yeah. how blatant. In the uh, in the '80s, uh, OPEC OPEC still works on a quota system. In other words, oh, excuse me. In the eighty in the '80s. Uh, Would you mind leaning back a little bit? Sure. Just, OPEC works on a quota reserve system, meaning that members of the OPEC uh, cartel, nobody talks about OPEC anymore. Why? Because OPEC is losing its clout. Uh, but they can only produce and pump oil based on uh, it being a percentage of their reserves in the ground. And what you saw in the 1980s as the Reagan administration was trying to bankrupt the Soviet Union, one of the ways it did so was by driving the oil price down to $18 a barrel because Russia depended upon foreign reserve currency from oil sales. But in order to do that, OPEC had to dramatically increase oil production to drive the price down. So what we see is a chart that I published in two books uh, now was that OPEC just took out a pencil and erased their number of reserves and they all of a sudden, the oil reserves of these countries tripled overnight, not as a result of geologic exploration, just because they wanted to. Uh, the, the only country that, that whose oil reserves didn't increase was Dubai. So what you see is Abu Dhabi, the Emirates, Iran, uh, uh, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, all the Venezuela. All of a sudden, all these, Indonesia, all these nations suddenly tripled their oil reserves, except for Dubai stayed a flat line. That's proof that all this stuff is just accounting bullshit. Here's one that goes to Wall Street. We had utility deregulation through, I believe, the Bush administration. Was that right? Mm -hmm. And I want you to describe in, as a case study how it's not people that these companies care about. It's the money and utility deregulation, people like Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. It becomes a, something different than something real that actually helps and influences people's lives. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully by now people will understand that deregulation is not a gift to the people. It's a gift to the corporations to steal from the people. Uh, since the Great Depression, uh, the United States was governed by a very sound, reasonable uh, law called the Public Utility Holding Company Act, PUCA, which mandated that whoever supplies your power, whoever pumps your water, had to have uh, storage and preparation for a 10, 20, 50, 100 year weather event. They had to have excess capacity. They had to maintain certain standards. What the repeal of PUCA did uh, under the Bush administration, among other things, was it just opened the door to the wholesale trading of power uh, for financial reasons rather than public need. We saw that in California with the Enron crisis, but it's still going on. Uh, and you see the, the selective uh, deployment of power now to favor uh, industrial commercial applications as opposed to residential applications. But the worst, and Matthew Simmons has truly done the, the, the best work on this of everybody. Matthew Simmons is a giant, and I salute his courage uh, and, his, and, and his alacrity. Uh, you know, he's, he's made it clear that what's happened, what's happened is, is that nobody's investing in the grid. One of the great stories, one of the best stories I wrote at uh, From the Wilderness was a story called The End of the Grid. It's still on the From the Wilderness website. 
But it's clear that since Puka and, and it, it was repealed and with the profit motive now, there's no investment in the grid. There's no investment in the sewers. There's no investment in any of the public utility services because the profit motive has taken over everything. Summarize Wall Street. And I don't mean the CIA ramifications, but just, just the, the parasitic, detached nature of this institution. How would you lay into that? Because I despise Wall Street. Wall Street is the capital of the United States of America. It owns, runs, and operates the United States government. I don't care what anybody says. And I guess in terms of horror movies, I would say that Wall Street is the, is the vampire capital of the universe. Uh, uh, it exists to, to serve a monetary paradigm. It controls commercial advertising. It, corporate Wall Street, six corporations control 90% of all the news heard by people in the United States, and they r report what serves the corporation. They have produced a nation, if you will, of people who serve as the batteries and the fodder to generate profit, uh, and that that's the that that's the heart of the beast. Well, no, no, actually, if if I were to really think of what the heart of the beast was in Wall Street, I would say it's the New York Federal Reserve Bank. That's where the real control is. Very good. In uh, the Truth and Lies of 9/11, the, the documentary you produced, you do a great job of finding the interconnectivities of, mm -hmm. uh, of CIA and Wall Street. Mm -hmm. If you were to summarize CIA connections to Wall Street and the best example you could think of? All, all intelligence agencies, whether it's uh, the CIA, MI6, the DFS in Russia, Bundesnachrichtendienst in Germany, whoever, Mossad in Israel, uh, they, they, they were created by and exist to serve the, the business, banking, and financial interests. That's why they were created. The economic uh, uh, use of drug money to fund banking goes back to the British East India Company when the British were smuggling opium into China in the 1700s to, crack, to, to create a market to create cash to open China and to generate lots of illicit cash that could be moved off the books. Uh, the CIA was created uh, in the National Security Act of 47, written by Clark Clifford, a Wall Street investment banker who was shamed and prosecuted for criminal corruption in the BCCI scandal. Uh, Alan Dulles, John Kennedy's uh, CIA director, who many believe had something to do with Kennedy's assassination, was a partner in the largest Wall Street law firm, Sullivan Cromwell. Bill Casey, uh, Ronald Reagan's CIA director, who ran the horrible Iran-Contra uh, mess, which, which resulted in the murder of thousands of tens of thousands of women and children. Under Bill Casey, U.S. domestic cocaine con consumption went from 60 metric tons in 1979 to 600 metric tons a year in 1987. That money laundered through Wall Street. Bill Casey was a stockbroker. Uh, when I wrote Crossing the Rubicon, the uh, the uh, uh, executive vice president of the New York Stock Exchange for Enforcement was a retired CIA general counsel. We could do the CIA connections to Wall Street for years, but just recently, in in, in as in... Uh, uh, in early 2010, I just clipped a story that uh, the CIA is now, quote, allowing its officers to moonlight directly for, for, for firms on Wall Street. That's not CIA officers moonlighting for Wall Street. They're just being called from the field office in Langley back to work for their real bosses. That's perfect. Thank you. That's great. Let me just change tapes real fast. I need a cigarette. Yeah, take your time. <sighs> Thanks, Mike. This is really good stuff. One other song? Yeah, man. I want to listen. song. Hey. Hey. I was really pleased to see... Get off the set. ...to see Collapse, though, because it was... Go lay down. Go lay down. <laughs> Go lay down. It was wonderful to see you actually get to speak and not just be a segment. Yeah. You know, because that was very well-deserved. Thank you. Well, it was a lot of work. We had five separate shoots, and some of them were really long. I heard that it was in the kind of basement of a... Uh, an abandoned commercial meatpacking plant downtown. Here, downtown, really. Yeah, it was so cold when we started filming in March that I would be shooting. It was like a seven-hour shoot, eight-hour shoot. And it was so cold that I'd be sitting there, and I'd start talking, and all, all of a sudden I'd wow. start going, like, cut. They'd wheel up two heaters, throw a blanket on me, wait till I warmed up again, take them off, and we'd start shooting was again. Was that strategic, or was that just the place you felt like 
That that Chris yeah. Chris made that call. Okay. Didn't want to keep you cold deliberately. No, no, it was That's just it was just fucking freezing down there. <laughs> Describe the significance of hydrocarbon energy to modern agriculture. Hmm. Modern agriculture wouldn't exist without hydrocarbon energy. It's that simple. Um, you have to drive an oil-powered machine to plow. You have to drive an oil-powered machine to plant, to, to sow the seeds. You have to uh, uh, burn hydrocarbon energy to irrigate. Uh, in the U.S. it's largely natural gas, in some cases oil, in some cases coal, uh, in some cases nuclear. Uh, very little, about 5-10% nuclear. But uh, while you're, the plants are growing, all the commercial fertilizers are made from natural gas. That's where ammonia comes from. All pesticides are made from oil, oil-based. And, hey, stop it. Not a big deal. There'll be subtle music underlying. I don't want to hear ass slurping noises in the middle of the movie, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> he looks at me like, what I do, what I do. Okay. Um, uh, and then when, when, when the plants are ready to, the crop is ready to harvest, you drive an oil-powered machine to harvest it. Then you drive it by another oil-powered machine to a processing plant where, you know, it's either the, the seeds are stripped out or whatever the case may be. That's all hydrocarbon energy. Then you drive it by another oil-powered machine to a factory where it's packaged and wrapped in plastic, which is oil. And another oil-powered machine drives it uh, to your supermarket. But now we have strawberries from Chile. We have uh, spinach from China. We have this globalization has turned into this obscene use of hydrocarbon energy because the only thing that's going to make a difference with 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy in every calorie of food is local food production. As the world collapses, as, as the economy collapses, as industrial civilization collapses, you're going to be forced to eat what's grown within 100 miles, 50 or 100 miles of your home. Uh, and uh, I, I got to tell you, if, if anybody just wakes up and tries to figure out how much of what they eat actually comes from within 100 miles now, they're going to be very surprised. I've been saying since 2002, 2003, the globalization was dead. And of course, uh, again, I've been, I and many others have been proven right on this fact. Uh, with oil at $80 a barrel now inhibiting growth, uh, you, you see a dramatic fall off in the number of flights because airlines are no longer profitable. So it's not profitable to bring uh, strawberries from Chile to a supermarket in Los Angeles when we grow some of the best strawberries in the world about 10 miles south of where we are right now. Uh, so all of that's coming to an end. Uh, anything that's based upon the use of cheap energy to transport goods and services around the world is coming to an end because cheap energy is coming to an end. Globalization is done. Uh, and things are going to revert to local everything uh, much faster than anybody could possibly imagine. Uh, I talk about lifeboats frequently, uh, about how people can survive the collapse of industrial civilization. And, and it, you know, I say it, and so does the whole peak oil sustainability movement. I'm not the only one for sure. We all recognize clearly that the people who are building lifeboats are relocalizing as a matter of priority, relocalizing to the point of trying to grow food in their backyard if they can restore the soil and, and uh, make it grow things off of petrochemicals. Hey, I mean, uh, it only takes about 500 years to replace an inch of topsoil. You think you want to go out and restore your backyard off, off of petrochemicals in a week? You've got another thing coming. It, it can be done faster, but we're burning topsoil as fast as we're burning oil and fresh water. And on that one, describe how peak oil will take us out, or whatever language you want to use, faster than global warming will. Well, I, I don't know which is going to take us out faster, peak oil or, or global warming. It's, it's, it's a perfect storm. We could see massive climate change that happen uh, at any time. It's, it's hard to predict that. But uh, certainly peak oil will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but what it's also going to do is reduce the human population. Uh, you have to have your priorities straight there. And as an aside, I'm probably not going to put this in there, but I'm curious to know your opinion. There's a whole slew of people out there that do not believe that global warming is real. And this is, I'm sure you've encountered this. Well, yeah. Okay, I prefer not to use the term global warming. I use the term climate change. And I don't care whether it's man-made or not. It's happening. 
uh, you know, uh, I I have no tolerance for for people who get caught up in semantic definitions and avoid the fact that there's something big and ugly coming down the railroad tracks that looks like a train that's going to kill us. I don't care what we call it. I just want to get out of the way. Okay, that's good. That's good. I just, you know, this is something that I'm really tired of hearing about. The, the, we're obviously producing CO2. It's pretty transparent, but there's a whole, you know, these people, I'm sure you've heard of these people. There's thousands of them, probably millions of them that refuse, you know, like Alex Jones people, these people that that's all they have to say is, it's just a big scam for the new world order. Don't worry about any of that shit. I'm not going to waste my time. Thank you. Okay, um, did that. Okay, war. I really love, you made a statement that's just so obvious, but no one thinks about it. War is the greatest waster of resources and energy that we've ever come up with. Mm -hmm. um, war evolved from prehistoric times when one tribe would invade another tribe's land for the resources. But now, because of the way the financial system works, war is, is, is probably the biggest driver of so-called economic growth. The U.S. military budget now is going to hit $700 billion a year, which means that you could roll up the eight other largest militaries in the world and you wouldn't even come close to what the U.S. spends on war. But the essence of war is, is that you spend energy and you mine resources to blow them up and destroy them so that you can make profit by building them all over again. That is the sickest form of economic growth, that, uh, that, 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 that you find a way to grow an economic paradigm by building stuff, wasting it, blowing it up, so you can make some more of the same stuff to blow up all over again. Perfectly stated. And also, it was a great point you made about how much oil the U.S. military actually consumes, which I was a, was a staggering number. Yeah, I, I don't recall the number off the top of my head. Summarize the importance of net energy okay. in the valuation of alternative energies. But you can start with just net energy as a definition. Net energy asks a very fundamental question that most people don't even think of. How much energy do you have to expend as opposed to how much energy you get return, returned? When oil was seeping out of the ground in Pennsylvania, you, you, energy is me measured in calories or joules or British thermal units, whatever. But let's say it's a, it's a, you know, it's a one widget of energy expense with the oil that was seeping out of the ground in Philadelphia, in, in, in Pennsylvania, light, sweet, crude, you would get a two to three hundred calorie return on your energy invested. Whereas there are serious studies that have been reaffirmed many times since showing that it takes more energy to make ethanol than you get from burning it. Now that is sheer stupidity. The Fischer-Tropsch uh, process developed by Nazi Germany in World War II converted coal to, to oil, to a syn synthetic oil, but it took more energy to do that than you got from burning the oil. And the only reason they did that was because they had en engines and tanks and airplanes and trucks that would only work on oil. Uh, and, and this is what is not asked about alternative energy sources or anything else that is, it, it should be the first question out of any person's mind. Uh, now, as, as, as the oil companies are moving into ultra deep water projects, the energy return on, on oil now is, I'm just estimating, maybe 20 to 1 as opposed to two or 300 to 1. Uh, that's why there will always be oil in the ground, if you think of it in terms of money. If, uh, if, if oil is selling for $80 a barrel and you've got oil that you can get, but it costs you $81 a barrel, nobody's ever going to get that oil. There will always be oil in the ground. That's the fundamental uh, meaning of what net energy is, and people need to start applying that test to all these so-called alternative energies. Very good. Here's more of a philosophical one, if you will, and I, th I think it's just a good cultural point. And it also couples in with uh, the general disposition that I share, which is that people are basically culminations of their society, and they're not really responsible for a great majority of their actions because there's so much distortion in society. They're just doing what is pushed upon them. You stated in your book, I cannot, cannot help but note the collective anger expressed by the birth of octuplets to an artificially inseminated single woman in California in early 2009. I recognize I recognize that our dysfunctional world, in our dysfunctional world, this woman has merely manifested the insanity of a position we have all endorsed and enabled. 
mm -hmm. wherever he would like to go with that expression, because I think it's a very important cultural one. Yeah, I mean... Oh, You're scooting down. Oh. I'm a little comfortable. We live in a very sick culture, and we see manifestations of that uh, frequently, uh, that when, when, when carried to their extremes look absurd, but on the other hand, uh, they really just are uh, echoing or carrying to a, a logical conclusion things that we all buy. Uh, more is better. Uh, more signifies success and or happiness. Uh, uh, Atomam had eight babies, but uh, I, you know, and 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 people made fun of that. But she's just basically doing what what the the culture of infinite growth and consumption suggests she she could do. She's creating more more demand for diapers, and food. Uh, but I think probably the most ironic and the most idiotic that I ever heard of was this guy who kind of heard that uh, global warming was a problem and oil might be running low and, 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 and Priuses would solve the problem. So he went out and bought five Priuses. I, I just, that's insane. But that's a reflection of the culture in which we live in which we've all, to one degree or another, uh, endorsed uh, or accepted. Uh, and, and, and so we have no, n nobody to blame but ourselves. And to extend to your work, uh, this is a little bit beside the point, but I'm, because you, your work as a field police officer, which I think in California must have been very intense at certain points, mm -hmm. you see a lot of aberrated behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, can you express the causality of the economic structure and how it relates to criminal activity in your experience? Do you, do you know what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's an old saying, pass a law, create a business whether you're creating a business for a lawyer or whatever. Uh, I've, since 2001, I, I have publicly opposed, or, or excuse me, publicly proposed uh, the decriminalization of all drug use. The war on drugs is a joke, and, 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 and really officially the United States has just surrendered in the war on drugs. It wasn't well publicized, but the U.S. is uh, recalling all of its DEA missions around the world because the war on drugs is over, it's been lost. Uh, so, you know, crime does create business, just like destruction creates, creates business in Haiti. We have now roughly two million people in, incarcerated in this country, and of those, many of them are in prisons run by private corporations, Corrections Corporation of America, Wackenhut, who trade their stock on Wall Street based upon how many people are in jail. Now, that's sickness, but that is a reflection of what this economic paradigm calls for. And here's the, I think this will be a final question, and I think it's a very important one. You have stated that um, the collapse of civilization will lead probably to a much more balanced, stable society, not no pun intended, but where mm -hmm. human values will be adjusted to reflect reality as it exists. And almost as though you, you've gestured that it's probably a good thing that we're going to be going through, oh. what we're about to go through. Well, what the human race is about to experience will be the single most significant event in its history since we left the metaphorical Garden of Eden, uh, which is, you know, Joni Mitchell had it right, and we've got to get ourselves back to the Garden. And, you know, she wrote that in, what, 69 or 70. Uh, but it's questionable at this point whether any of our species will survive. We could nuke ourselves. We, we could unleash a, a biological plague that would wipe us all. Mother Earth could get rid of us with a fever as if we were an infectious agent and she created the fever to rid herself of this organism that was attacking her. Uh, so it's questionable as to whether we will survive. I think it's, it, is, it is inevitable that uh, as stasis returns, the survivors... And this is what I have dedicated my whole life to. It's not this generation now. We're beyond redemption. I'm, I've am i dedicated my life to serving the generations who are going to inherit this god-awful mess that we're leaving them. Uh, they will certainly understand the need for balance and connection to the planet, to life around us, uh, to, uh, to things that are important. Stasis and balance will be there, unless, uh, not, uh, God forbid, that somehow this, uh, the, uh, the keepers of this economic paradigm somehow survive to try to recreate it all over again. That can't happen. 
You know, I I think the the one thing that everybody needs to get right now is there are no more tomorrows. Today is not a drill. We are in the collapse of human industrial civilization. And when people are thinking about what to do now, they have got to stop thinking in terms of initiating governmental reform processes that never work and that take years and that are corrupted by lobbyists. You really start need to think about detaching yourself from the economic paradigm. Debt is the mark of the beast. You also need to start finding out what you can do with your family, uh, your neighbors, uh, your tribe, if you will, to start building your lifeboats right now. The best, the best places to start where you might get some governmental response are local and county governments. States are, states are very problematic, but the, but the federal government now is basically useless, if not in fact an enemy. I think that's good. I think that's good. Yeah. You feel good about that? You got a lot of good shit. Good. You got a lot of good shit. Thanks so much, man.